Q and A uh, portion on the lower part of the bar here on Zoom. Um, please submit questions to me. And without further ado, I want to. I'm very, very happy. It's it's particularly um, uh, very special to me that one of our former students is coming back for a Zoom. And I was here when you graduated, Connor, so it's fantastic. Connor O'Brien, 2010, uh, is now uh, at the top of his game covering uh, defense policy for Politico um, in the area of Congress. So he spent a decade uh, covering Capitol Hill. Um, before that, he's, he was working for uh, CQ Roll Call another big name in, in reporting on Capitol Hill. Uh, he was a student ambassador when he was here. Um, one of our great students, uh, remembered fondly by the staff here in particular. Uh, and so Connor, I am thankful that you are joining us today. Neil, thanks for having me. Good to, good to, good to be back at least virtually. <laughs> well, let's dive right into this. Uh, you're covering Congress, you're covering mainly defense policy. Today you have an article on uh, the fact that there are still 5,000 guardsmen at the Capitol despite uh, bipartisan calls for security to be eased back. Um, what are some of the political factors at play in this current situation? Do you see the military's uh, relationship with Congress changing uh, over the long term? This is an interesting issue. Uh, yeah, this is a very complex thing. I mean, as as um, you know, I know I know you had an event uh, last month with uh, with my friend Matt Fuller, where he talked about being at the Capitol on January sixth. Uh, I, I wasn't there, but I know I know a lot of people who were. And um, uh, you know, in in the wake of that, thousands of guards were guardsmen were flooded to the Capitol uh, area. There's still about five thousand of them uh, there. To provide security against, you know, against, you know, uh, what they believe to be, you know, some some ongoing uh, threats against the building, um, but we're starting to see some cracks in that. Uh, you know, um, we're starting to see some increased criticism of of the heavy uh, security presence there. So yesterday, the story that I wrote was actually it was, it was a top Republican, top Democrat, uh, Adam Smith, the chairman. Armed Services Committee and a top Republican on the committee, Mike Rogers, who's a, who's a conservative Republican from Alabama, saying there needs to, you know, we need to do a real assessment of the security situation in the Capitol, and it's time that the Guard needs to go home. Um, you know, there's been a, a you know, and, um, you know, you hear that from both parties. Uh, earlier in the week, Mitch McConnell was critical of the increased Guard presence, the uh, fencing, around the Capitol complex that uh, some want to make permanent or have like an ability to roll up, roll down, uh, according to, you know, the security threat. Um, There's a lot of talk about uh, early in March, there po potentially being another threat against the Capitol because uh, there's a, a QAnon uh, conspiracy theory that early March, the original uh, constitutional inauguration date would be the date that Donald Trump actually became president again. There didn't really, you know, there there was not really much of a showing there, um, and so you're you're starting to see these calls uh, for the guard to 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 go home for there to be kind of this secure this kind of grappling with the security uh, there, and you know it's discouraging as someone who I I have not worked there consistently since the pandemic started. Um, I would normally be working out of the press gallery uh, in the Capitol uh, with a lot of other reporters. Um, and, you know, um, I haven't been there since this was kind of rolled out, but it's really discouraging to see as someone who, who, you know, that's, that's where you work. That's kind of the home away from home, spend a lot of, uh, days and nights there. Um, so it, what we saw, what we saw is the guard mission has been extended another couple months, uh, into May, a couple thousand are going to remain there, but this is going to be a continuing issue. Um, you know, the concern from people who, uh, from members of Congress who are keyed in on military issues, is this this is going to be an issue for of of readiness for the guard? Are they capable of doing the mission if we have this extended deployment of thousands of troops for months? Um, you know, President Biden is deploying guard to help vaccinate Americans right now. That's another key mission, disaster response. They do a lot of things, 
and this the cost is going to pile up is what they're warning and uh you know the, the the readiness the mission readiness could go down so it's going to be something that we're going to want to watch out for in the coming you know weeks and months um you know is there increasing pressure do they go home early uh, do they find some kind of medium uh there uh, that's that's kind of where we are so that gets to the point where usually a reporter would walk around Capitol Hill, you bump into Mike Rogers, you're able to sort of talk to him face to face with COVID. And now with the situation with the guard and the lockdown, that's changed. How hard is your job compared to when you first landed on Capitol Hill? Yeah, well, and, th and this is where I got to give a got to give a, a big pat on the back to my colleagues, uh, because the Capitol Hill press corps has worked so well together to keep the situation uh, safe for people, make it so people don't have to unnecessarily go up there, you know, and and put their health at risk. A lot of members have have caught COVID. Uh, some some members of the of the press have as well, um, and that's certainly a risk. Um, I've been up there a few times, um, uh, you know, during this. And what I've what I like to do is, or what I've done in these cases is. It was, uh, I made sure it was an unseasonably warm day. I waited kind of on the plaza on the east front of the Capitol where a lot of House members usually come out after they vote to go back to their offices. And that's how I, that's how I worked um, uh, my, my job. But you're right, in, in normal times, we'd be waiting in the hallways, big scrums of reporters around one particular member of Congress that is making news that day or is a swing vote on a bill, something like that. But, you know, a thing that the Capitol Hill Press Corps has done very well is they've created this pool where, you know, only a certain number of people um, are kind of there. Um, you know, you can go up if you need something, but you, you, uh, you know, what, the, what this pool does is when, you know, they capture a, you know, a lawmaker on tape, uh, you know, about some issue of the day, they'll send it out to this listserv so people have that information. You know, people don't have to feel like they need to be up there for that. Um, but, but, you know, it, it, it is still limiting. You know, you don't have that ready access. The reason covering uh, Congress is so great is it's not like, um, you know, you can't just walk around the White House. You can't just, uh, you know, walk around various government departments. You can kind of do that with the Pentagon, actually, a little bit. But you don't have the kind of access to the influential people that you would in Congress. And so, um, you know, it's been relying on a lot of sources. Um, you know, it's been, you know, it's been, it's been a team effort. Um, it's been limiting, but we've, I think we've, I think we've made it work uh, in, in a way that I would have seen, that I would have thought would have been um, uh, very hard to do uh, this time a year ago. So how did you fall into the beat of defense? I mean, uh, was it something that you had an interest in or was it all of a sudden you got assigned by your editor? Hey, we want you to cover this. You did a good job. And all of a sudden this is your niche. Yeah. So um, it's actually, um, as I was kind of preparing for this, I thought back to my days at, at St. Anselm College and, um, you know, it was kind of always something that was on my mind, always interested in politics. I came in as a politics major um, and was there, you know, during the 08 primary and everything. There was no way you could not be into politics, you know, sitting through that primary, um, you know, of, of, of Obama and Clinton and then Obama and McCain. Uh, it's, it's just incredible. Um, those, um, you know, meeting so many candidates and everything like that. But I was always kind of interested in defense issues. And I think back to my freshman year, um, the midterm of 2006 happened and Democrats took over. And what swept Democrats into power was the unpopularity of the Iraq war. And that continued to be a thing as, um, you know, Bush pursued the surge, um, Democrats opposed that. Um, I remember, um, and, and so I've, I'd, I'd say I've always had an interest in, it. you know, I, um, I think international relations might've actually been the first politics class I took at St. A's, not intro to politics. <laughs> um, so, and, and then, you know, uh, pursued it from, from there. Uh, uh, it was either my sophomore or junior year. I took uh, an American foreign policy class, which I really loved. Um, I took uh, defense policy, which was uh, taught at the time by uh, Professor Joe Constance, who was at the uh, research library, who was at the, the library and taught out of uh, one of the classrooms of the library. And that was uh, super interesting. Um, 
you know, so it kind of fed into, uh, to, I, I always really liked it. Um, I broke in in DC um, as, as an intern with a couple, I did a couple internships back to back with uh, some national security and some foreign policy uh, think tanks. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I hooked on with, uh, with CQ was my, was my first kind of real job out of college, um, not doing anything national security related. I was doing more uh, research, data entry, that sort of thing. But, you know, I, I showed them over time. I wanted to, you know, do more writing. I wanted to pursue stuff. So um, o- over time, uh, actually, and I'm sure we'll get into this later, but you know, um, you know, about the committee process and about how the House Armed Services, they mark up one big defense bill every single year. And they needed an extra, they needed somebody to do um, data entry for all the votes that the House Armed Services Committee did. And, um, you know, like if you, if you follow the House Armed Services Committee at, at all, you know, this one committee meeting of this like thousand page bill that they write every single year, they, they start at 10 in the morning, you know, probably sometime in May, June, whatever. Um, and they don't take any breaks. They keep going until they're done, you know, at three, four, five in the morning. A couple years ago, we were there when the sun came up. Um, and they do, they take like 200 votes on, on amendments, on substantive defense stuff. They debate defense issues, defense spending. And uh, so I, I was the guy tasked with putting all of that into our database and, you know, as soon as as soon as the um, you know the opportunity to become a full time reporter covering those committees came up, I I was able to slide into that, and I've kind of been in one form or another doing that um, ever since. I did that for a couple of years with CQ, and um, you know was fortunate enough to move over to Politico, um, where I've been covering you know defense issues on the Hill uh, since then. Uh, it's been about five years now. Well. Uh... <laughs> On that, you know, when Biden said that the authorization for use of military force, that he was open to repealing this, a lot of us sort of fell off our chair thinking, you know, if you go back to your, everyone's, what everyone studied in college, you know, presidential power, you know, the, it's so rare for a president to say that they'd be willing to give up some power. Uh, tell us how that all came about. And were you surprised by that as well? And do you think it's really going anywhere? Well, that's, um, uh, that's, you know, we're on step one or, you know, step like three of, you know, uh, 250 or something like that, uh, I think. Uh, but th- that Joe Biden came out and said, uh, you know, he would be willing to have to revise these war powers. Uh, I think it is, is a really, is a really big deal. Um, you know, I, we were talking uh, just before we got on here about, you know, stimulus passed two trillion dollars. That's incredibly important. Um, and I think that overshadowed this quite a bit, uh, you know, for obvious issues. But, um, you know, there's been this push um, for a very long time to uh, to revise these um, this legislation that's been on the books since 9-11 happened and since the, the invasion of Iraq happened. Um, that, that gave the president these powers to pursue uh, terrorist groups, you know, um, uh, mo- you know, in the, in the Middle East and Afghanistan at the time. However, um, you know, I think any member of Congress will tell you it's been stretched far beyond uh, what was ever intended, you know, in the wake of 9-11, you know, when we were very focused on what specifically happened. And now there are all these, you know, various spread out threats across the world that we're dealing with. And we're using a legal authority that's almost 20 years old at this point. So, you know, um, it's really tough. Um, You need to agree on what a replacement would look like. And I don't know that there's a lot of that agreement yet, but in order to do it, uh, you, you, I think you have to have presidential participation. They tried this, when Obama was uh, president, he, he, you know, he was, the White House was active in some discussions. Uh, he had, um, uh, you know, he had, um, he proposed taking the 2002, the, the authorization that was passed for the Iraq war off the books, but not the 2001, which is Afghanistan and all these other, um, used for all these other terrorist groups that we, that we're combating now. 
Um, Biden has indicated that he's willing to revise it all. Um, the question, you know, the question really is, what can they, what can they agree to? Um, and there, there are so many steps between uh, here and there. You know, I, I mean, uh, do progressive Democrats want, you know, limits on geography. You know, what countries you can use. Uh, you know, you can use military force, and they want a sunset. Uh, you know, so you can only it's only good for maybe a couple of years or it has to be renewed every couple of years. Um, you know, cons defense hawks, more conservative lawmakers would want something, um, you know, want something uh, a little broader, probably that gives the president some more latitude. Um, you know, I, and I thought it was notable. Um, I just I just got off a press call right after right before this, actually, with progressive Democrats. Um, you know, Adam Schiff, who's the chairman of the Intelligence Committee, Jim McGovern from Worcester, a uh, bunch of uh, Barbara Lee, uh, who's, who's the only person who voted against the 2001 AUMF. Um, and, you know, they, but they do think this is an opportunity. So I think, uh, you know, I think it's probably, um, they're, the, the, the starting out of the gate, it looks better than it has before. So it's, it's one we're gonna follow. I mean, it's, it's, it's really critical. I think, um, you know, um, you know, Congress has ceded a lot of authority on how we wage our wars and, you know, will they, will they reclaim that? Uh, you know, can both parties agree on that? Uh, I think it's going to be a key debate that happens, uh, you know, in the coming months. So on that, some people believe that if there are any similarities between the Biden administration and the Trump administration, it might be on China. So do you see that the defense policy is really going to be focused from here on out on China or is it going to be the Middle East or somewhere else? Yeah, I do think I do think that's a that's a big similarity is you've had a lot of tough talk early on uh, when it comes to China. Um, you know, a couple of hearings I covered uh, this week where the commander of U.S. Pacific Command, U.S. forces in the Pacific, um, Came up and it was basically pitching lawmakers on this on this um, this budget request that he made for about five billion dollars for the coming year to basically build up our forces in the Pacific to deter China. That's one that's got a lot of agreement, you know, from both parties. Um, I, you know, I, I think I think you're right though. The question is how you know how much do you get pulled back in? Uh, by the conflicts in the Middle East, by Af, you know, Afghanistan, which um, you know, the, the president has to make a decision um, whether we're going to withdraw completely by, by May. And it doesn't, it doesn't appear that that's what's going to happen. But um, you know, uh, the, the thing is, you have so many competing issues. You have so many competing resources. You have a lot of opinions about what should be done with the with I don't want to say the little money we have because the defense budget is over seven hundred billion dollars, but it's expected to be flat. And you know, we're not, we're probably not going to be doing things like taking troops out of Europe. We're probably not, for the moment, going to be withdrawing from Afghanistan. So if we want to build up in, you know, if if you know, if we want to, if we want to really take on China in a in a military sense, you know, deter them from, you know, messing with our allies in the Pacific Ocean, um, you know, we're going to have to make, you know, the Pentagon and Congress is going to have to make a lot of choices about how to spend the money that they already have. You know, do you cut elsewhere? Do you cut these big weapon systems that cost a lot of money? And that's, you know, that's where Congress comes in because they have a lot of parochial interests, in this, even though they, they like the idea of taking on China. Um, I got a great question submitted by a faculty member, Professor Lucas asks, I think most people think about members of Congress as caring mostly about press and of their constituents uh, that they care about. And on the other hand, a lot of defense and foreign policy goes over the heads of most people. Can you talk about why members of Congress spend time talking to, you, to journalists like yourself? In other words, uh, how do they get out? What do they get out of it, essentially? Um, well, you know, a lot of them do care about those issues. I, I mean, I think when I think about that, I think, um, you know, I think back to, um, I, 
you know, this is kind of a, it's kind of a roundabout way of answering it, but I guess what, a thing that I think about a lot is, um, one of the reasons I like defense issues is it touches so many other things, you know, um, the defense budget is huge itself. The, um, the, um, uh, you know, the, um, uh, you know, there, there, there's so many policy issues that it, that it touches healthcare, education. You know, we talked about, um, you know, race, gender, and extremism. Those are issues in broader society that the military is grappling with. But defense, you know, it has broad support in Congress for, uh, you know, a, a number of reasons. And I think a big one is that it does touch a lot of people's districts um, and home states. Um, I, I think about some of the major uh, weapons that get that are they're being built. Um, you know, we we're talking a lot about this week about um, you know the the F thirty five fighter when you know which is the only new fighter that the Pentagon buys anymore. It's built by Lockheed Martin in Texas, but when you spread out the supply chain, it's it's like forty seven states that help build that thing. Um, everybody has a vested interest in defense. Um, you know, there, there are, but there, I think there is a genuine interest on the part of many members as well, uh, of, you know, you know, so, uh, in, in recent, uh, in recent years, we've seen an influx of members with a, you know, with foreign policy, defense, intelligence backgrounds. I think of the, I think of the members who've come in in just the last few years that I cover pretty regularly, like, uh, you know, Alyssa Slotkin from Michigan, who was a Pentagon official and a CIA uh, officer, you know, a guy by the name of Mike Gallagher from Wisconsin, who was, uh, uh, who was, uh, worked on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee before running for Congress himself, a uh, guy by the name of Tom Malinowski from New Jersey, who worked for the State Department before running for Congress, a Democrat, um, on both sides of the aisle. And I think, I think part of it is, you know, they're trying to make the case that these are, you know, these are interconnected, um, you know, that people need to care about national security. You often hear people say things like economic, you know, national economic securities, national security, stuff like that. I, I, I think that's a big part of it too. So, you know, touching down a little bit on healthcare, you mentioned healthcare and as it relates to defense, it's interesting, I guess that one third of American troops have decided that they're not going to take the vaccine. So do you think that Biden could mandate that they take it? Um, obviously, you have to do what the commander in chief says. Um, is there concern? Do you hear a lot about this statistic? It's been a huge concern uh, in, um, you know, both the House and Senate have had the Pentagon up to talk about their COVID protocols, what they're doing to assist in the pandemic response. And, you know, I, um, you know, a big concern for Republicans and Democrats was, was, you know, the level of vaccination. The Pentagon had been hesitant to give that figure out um, from the briefing room. And it came out in one of these hearings that they said, what they said was a two thirds acceptance rate. That means that, that means that a third, uh, you know, is, is not, does not appear to be taking. Um, so yeah, that's a huge concern. Uh, the thing there that they run into is that this is an FDA approved uh, drug. It's operating under a, uh, all the vaccines so far are operating under a, um, an, um, an emergency use authorization. So I, I, I um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, uh, this has been a big discussion, but the basic thing is if it's under this emergency use authorization, you pretty much can't make people take it. Um, I think there's a longer uh, legal path to maybe do that. Uh, I'm not I'm not well versed in 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 all the law surrounding this, but basically they they can't mandate it at present because it's because it's under this emergency use. But you are starting to see this push to you know get get troops vaccinated, um, you know, and as as a matter of as a matter of military readiness, you know. Um, you don't, you know, they don't want to deploy people necessarily who haven't been vaccinated. They can't stop that, obviously. But, you know, you want, you want people who are doing, you know, who are, uh, you know, doing these missions, uh, you want them to 
be healthy. Um, so that's, um, you know, you've seen that effort from the Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, from others to try to work at this problem. But it's, um, yeah, it's one that's been really concerning. And I think, I think members of Congress are going to have a lot of questions about it going forward as it becomes more widely available. And speaking of uh, the Secretary Austin, you know, he required a waiver from the National Security Act of 1947, and so did General Mattis. Uh, are we going to start to see that maybe they have waivers every single time or alter the act in any way? It just seems sort of ridiculous that the last two had to get these waivers. And is there any discussion about that? Yeah, well, there's a, <laughs> there's a, um, you know, it's it's interesting. So um, I remember when I um, uh, we we're talking about we we're talking about um, Mike Rogers, who's a Republican, who um, is the top Republican on the House Armed Services Committee. His justification: um, a lot of Republicans didn't support uh, the waiver for for Secretary Austin. Um, you know, in part because they thought that the process was rushed. Um, uh, you know, there was going to be a public hearing. Uh, in front of the House, which is not a normal thing that the House does with a cabinet nominee. But you were talking about the waiver. There's, there's a law that says, you know, basically, if you're a retired general, retired admiral, you have to be out of the military for seven years before you can become Secretary of Defense. And that was the case with Jim Mattis, too, under Trump. And um, both of them had only been out for three or four years. Congress passed both of those. But the, the justification I heard from, from one top Republican was, you know, one for one for us, one for them. You know, um, that sounds fair. Um, you know, I, I think I think there is a lot of concern um, that of what this could mean for civilian control of the military. Um, you know, do, you know there were um, some of these some of these hearings are really great because they bring in experts um, to just give their kind of unvarnished view of the issues, no spin. You know pro-anti-administration or pro-anti-any nominee, um, just kind of what they see as the consequence of these laws and of granting these waivers. And, uh, you know, you know, people say, you know, like the, um, you know, it's uh, a, a very common uh, concern is that, you know, this is going to be the norm, that, that what's to stop the next president from naming another four-star general or admiral to you know, who got out of uniform a couple of years ago to, to be the, uh, to be the secretary of defense. And, you know, I think there are going to be some serious discussions of, of should this, should the, should the, should the, the length, should it be, should it be seven years? Should it be maybe 10? Should it be knock it down to five? Um, should it even exist at all? If, if Congress is just going to waive it every single time. So, um, you know, I think, I think that's going to be, an important thing. I think people are worried about after four years of Trump, you know, um, the politicization of the military. Um, uh, and, but, you know, beyond that, I think a more important issue is not just, you know, what this, what a person's background is, but who do they surround themselves with once they, once they get into the Pentagon, you know, um, what we saw with Jim Mattis, was he surrounded himself with a lot of people that he served with, you know, in the in, when he was commander of U.S. forces in the Middle East, when he was at in other positions in the Marine Corps. Uh, his chief of staff was was a Navy admiral that he served with, um, you know, and other things like that. And and do they have respect for the senior civilian positions in the Pentagon? So there there was it's a it's a small detail, but there were you know members of Congress who pushed Austin on this and, you know, got his commitment to empower a lot of these senior civilian positions. So that, that's going to be one that will take time because um, there are only two Senate confirmed people in the entire Pentagon right now. Everyone else is an acting official and, um, you know, Biden still hasn't named a broader slate of people to run like the military services and you know, take charge of all these senior positions. So that's going to be key too. Um, you know, I, I, there is a lot of fear out there though, that this is kind of a slippery slope that, you know, why, why does this even exist if Congress just you know, waves it every single time? So 
let's get into something a little fun. And that is, is that uh, Fox News, Tucker Carlson, uh, really mocked uh, the Defense Department and the military. Um, and they responded sort of indirectly, but they still responded. Were you surprised about that? What is the, what was the real behind the scenes talk about what he said and and was there a blowback on Fox? Is there a lot of competition too amongst all of you, uh, particularly on the ground level as reporters? Um, competition, but a but a, a healthy competition, I think. Um, I will I will couch this and say that I'm not a Pentagon reporter, um, uh, but I know I know a lot of great ones. Um, you know, I, I was I was kind of surprised how how they took that on. Uh, you know, directly. Um, but, but frankly, um, I mean, I mean, frankly, I kind of subscribe to the view that, that the, you know, it, it, this was, I would be more concerned if this was attack, an attack directly on a news journalist, not, 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 not someone who, who is, who, who does opinion for, for a, you know, um, you know, who, who is, who's an opinion, opinionated person who, who's not, who's not doing straight defense journalism. And I think, I think there were, I think there were a lot of, you know, frankly, bad faith elements of that, of that attack. Um, um, and, you know, that said, there are, you know, there are great journalists at Fox News who do a lot of great reporting at the Pentagon and, and elsewhere. Um, and, you know, are not that that's, that's not them, you know? Um, and so I, I you know, um, it, does, it does get at what I think is going to be a broader theme um, of, um, of, you know, um, of the, the, the right kind of attacking, not, you know, not just the Pentagon, but, you know, initiatives as part of like, um, you know, as part of, as part of like a culture war attack. Um, you know, um, it, this was this was a big a big Trump thing was was culture wars was you know taking on you know um, was you know kind of and using that to to rile up the base and um, you know I think um, uh, I, I think I think we're gonna you know we 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 saw this a little bit with the attacks on. Um, you know when the when the Secretary of Defense ordered a, you know a uh, what's called a stand down, uh, which is basically where the military takes a day, um, and they discuss, you know, an issue of importance. And this this one that he ordered across the military services was to discuss extremism in the ranks, and um, you know it was being attacked as you know uh, a political, um, you know like a political cleansing, like a political litmus test in in the ranks. Um, you know, when there are some findings showing that uh, the military doesn't have a really good sense of extremism in, in the ranks. And, you know, this is all this is stuff that took place post January 6th. So I think it's kind of a broader, you know, a, a broader thing that you're going to see as, as kind of this, this culture wars narrative you know, that's, that's been going on, you know, for a number of years. And um, and, you know, I think it's going to I think that's that's what it, what it is part of. Do you think they were surprised by the fact that many of the people involved with that one six incident and insurrection were, were uh, former military and that there was a lot of extremism? Do you think they were caught off guard by it? Uh, I think that's a possibility. I, I you know, uh, I think they, you know, it, you know, from what, from what Pentagon officials have, have said, I don't, you know, um, it, it, it doesn't seem like that is necessarily um, something they've got a great handle on at the moment. Um, you know, and, and so, um, you know, I'll be interested to see how this, you know, how these discussions go, um, you know, how they're received in the force, like what the feedback is. Um, but I think, I think too, um, uh, you know, the, they're going to be, they're going to be a great many of these personnel issues, if I can just probably just put it that way, that, that are, that come up this year, both, you know, from, from the Pentagon and on, on Capitol Hill, um, an increasing, you know, 
a, a big thing in the wake of, of uh, you know, of Black Lives Matter protests and of George Floyd's killing was, um, uh, you know, uh, was that the military has had to grapple with, with you know, with, with race, um, you know, with a lack of diversity in the, in its officer corps, um, you know, um, uh, there was a new, um, there's now, there's now a new, um, chief of staff of the air force, uh, general, uh, general CQ Brown, who is the first, uh, military chief of staff who, who is, who's black, at least the first, um, first, uh, African-American member of the joint chief since Colin Powell in the early nineties. And, um, you know, he was, uh, you know, when he was confirmed and took the job, he was very frank about, um, you know, being, you know, being one of the only people of color in his fighter squadron, in you know, in his various you know uh, outfits as a as an officer, um, that's very clearly something that they're going to have to grapple with. Another thing that they're you know that is going to be um, that is going to be discussed in addition to extremism, I think, is going to be you know sexual assault in the ranks of the military. Um, you know, many members of Congress have made clear that if they don't see the progress that they want, you know, the, the military has kind of said they're on this for years, um, and the numbers don't reflect that they've done a great job at combating that issue. And a lot of members of the of of Congress have have warned that you know they're not gonna, um, you know, they they might vote to do something as drastic as taking the military chain of command out of the de decisions to prosecute those kinds of crimes. Um, you know, I think those are all going to be big issues going forward, in the, you know, the next, uh, you know, this year and in, in the coming years, probably. So uh, hitting a little bit, going back a little bit on ethics, you know, um, how uh, important do you think it is at this point that we have ethical journalism and how were our Anselmian traditions and the Benedictine teachings here helped you through your reporting? But I also want you to sort of hit on, you know, I think of you, I remember you fondly, and I think of you on the quad uh, with your diploma in your hand. And if you could go back and think about that period of time, did you, did you realize this would be your passion and this would be what you were really, really good at? Did you think that you would get where you are today? Um, and what kind of advice would you have for students that are, you know, the, the same questions that were asked in 2010 of me are asked every day, which is, I don't know what I'm gonna do for the rest of my life. And it's hard to sort of negotiate back, but I'm wondering if you could shed some advice for students that are listening. Mm -hmm. uh, well, looking back, uh, the very, the, the short answer is no, <laughs> I, um, I, d I don't quite think, um, uh, I knew I'd be here. Um, I think, I think when, when I was in, um, when I was in college, um, I think maybe like really early on, I thought I wanted to go to law school and then I, and then I realized, no, I didn't want to do that. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, what allowed me to kind of, um, of taking taking the first part of your of your question, um, you know, ethics. I mean, there's no doubt that that ethics is important in any any field, but it's especially important in 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 our, in our field of, of journalism because you you don't um, you know you're trying to get at the truth ultimately, you know, and and you and you need to have that trust with, um, you know, with, with your, with your audience, with your reader, um, that that is what you are doing. Um, you know, we can't always, um, we, we can't always, uh, be, um, you know, we can't, you, you know, not, a, not everyone is going to be pleased at, at what you read. You have to tell inconvenient truths. It doesn't, you know, you, you don't, you know, you can't, you can't pull punches and, you know, uh, gloss over, things, um, you know, you have to, you have to be, um, you have to acknowledge that, but at the end of the day, you're, you're, you're seeking out the truth. Um, and I think that's incredibly important. What I would, um, you know, what I would say, um, you know, I think the things, I think the things that helped me, you know, um, I, 
I, you know, I, I think part of being a um, part of a great liberal arts education is uh, how well-rounded it, it is. And I think that's, I think that's kind of what I, what I took into doing this job is it's, you know, it's about being, uh, you know, it's about being a good writer, but it's also about being able to figure out the context of things, you know, figure out how to put facts into context and ask the tough questions. No, no, most importantly, what, what are the right questions to ask? Um, and, and, and so I credit, you know, I, I credit my education with, at, at St. A's with, with a lot of that, um, you know, and, um, you what know, about really your, sort of, what about your senior thesis, having to defend it? That must have been, yeah. uh, you know, spring training for you in your job today. Uh, I, <laughs> yes. Um, and I, and I will say, um, uh, I, I have no desire to reread my senior thesis because I, I don't I don't want to I do not want to know what what uh, uh, I don't want to quite revisit that. But I do remember I wrote it on um, on uh, like unmanned weapons system, which I feel vindicated by because that's now a huge uh, thing um, that was kind of on the forefront at the at the time. Um, so, but yes, that running running that gauntlet uh was you know the, the rigor of the research uh you you start that semester i forget what the length requirement was i want to say it was like 40 50 pages or something um you know you see that and you think oh my god i'm never going to graduate <laughs> um but you know you put the work in you 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 develop um uh, you know uh professor lucas was my thesis advisor and uh and 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 uh and whipped me into shape on that one. And, uh, you know, you develop the idea, you develop the argument, you do the research, uh, you know, you, you put it through the ringer and then you have to stand up for, you know, for your, um, you know, for what you wrote. And that's, and, and that's a very key tenet of, of journalism. You got to write something that you can stand behind, you know, that's supported by, by what you're able to, the facts you're able to gather, the people you talk to sources you have um I, you know it's no it was a very valuable experience to say to say the least um you know and so and i credit that you know being you know being able to write you know and you know is is a very transferable skill i think that was a very valuable part of you know the the breadth of my classes at saint a's um you know it, it being in journalism, you're writing, you're trying to distill the key point with imperfect facts uh, a lot of the time, but you're trying to figure out what's really going on and say it in a manner that that anybody can read. You know, you're not just writing it for for some some guy in a back office at the, at the Pentagon or on Capitol Hill who sees an acronym and they automatically know what what you're talking about. Um, you know, you're trying to do this in a in a way that 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 people understand. So I think all of that is quite valuable. Well, Connor, I think we have time for one last question. So I'm going to uh, read this. This was uh, submitted. Uh, you once tweeted back in 2017, and I'll quote your tweet: "2025, Senator Kid Rock proposes a repeal of the 2001 AUMF." to reign in the war powers of President Dwayne Johnson. That's the rock, by the way. Um, and so the questioner says, would you stand by that statement? Um, uh, <laughs> well, uh, you know, maybe it, it, you know, it may take longer to repeal the, the, the 2001 AMF. Well, we'll see. Um, I don't, uh, I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I believe, I believe the president Dwayne Johnson part more than I believe the Senator Kid Rock part. Cause he, 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 he flirted with the idea of running in Michigan. Um, but you know, we'll, 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 we'll see. I, I, I think, um, could be a Dwayne Johnson may have a, may have a future in politics yet. I mean, if he runs out of fast and furious movies to make, you know, that would not surprise me being here in the center of political presidency. And, 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 and if he comes to the NHIOP, ask him the tough questions. <laughs> ask him about the AUMF. 
Well, this has been great, Connor. Um, again, it's really wonderful to have, to be interviewing a student that graduated when I was here and it just comes full circle. Um, I think this is really beneficial, particularly the part on the, on the senior thesis, which I'm glad that we recorded because we're going to play that for our seniors here. Uh, and, and we just wanna thank you for, for taking the time today. And this is a wonderful place as we all know, St. Anselm College and this community are great. And we welcome you back as many times as you can get here. Uh, and we're very proud of your accomplishments and we look forward to reading you in the future. Thanks for having me. Thank you all.